everybody, my name is Chase Pipes and you're that watching Chase in History, brought to you by American Digger Magazine and we are the educational arm of the Smoky Mountain Relic Room and we are back, yeah, <laughs> yes. dude, Western Montana, hey Chase, how are good buddy, you? Eamon Yeager with Northwest Montana Fossils. Eamon, thank you so much for oh, having us anytime. out anytime, happy dude. to have you guys out again. So we're back on the Two Medicine, hanging out, digging dinosaurs. Eamon, explain what's going on here, where are we, what is this formation, all that good so stuff. So we're in the Two Medicine formation of Northwest Montana. We're just on the eastern front of the Rockies here. Um, the Two Medicine Formation is a Cretaceous formation that's about 74 and a half million years old and ranging into 72 million years old as well. So that's right kind of just before the tail end of the dinosaurs? Well, it's, it's called Campanian Cretaceous. It's almost kind of towards the middle of the Cretaceous. Okay. So the Cretaceous is a small window. But what's really neat about the Two Medicine Formation is we're actually more inland from the Great Western Interior Waterway. Okay. And so we're, you know, these dinosaurs are kind of more like the hills more so than the ocean front. Okay, so. so we had this great, imagine the United States as it is today, and this big arm of the ocean just went right up through the middle of the United States. And we're on the edge of that, but up in the hills. Yes, yep, absolutely. We're a couple, a couple hundred miles away from the ocean line there, or from the shore. Okay. So these dinosaurs kind of preferred to be a little bit more inland, they kind of like the more swampy start, sort of style of living, I guess you could say. Um, so what we have here is a dried, evaporated swamp bed. And some of the dinosaurs actually died within the swamp bed. Maybe they got attacked, maybe they got stuck in the mud. Who knows? So, <laughs> but we have actually quite a few good bones coming out of this site. And it's actually been working out pretty well. So you can see that we've slothed this whole entire thing going north to south, and we're just getting into the layer now. Now here's so. one thing that's really interesting about this layer is, is that it's, the bones are laying at this angle going down. Yes. So how, how is that possible? Because so, I mean, because no, you look, everything's, you know, flat. Yep, yep. And these bones, I, you know, settled flat. Yep. But yep. now they're like this. <laughs> it's so, all messed up. So we find bones within what's called anticlines. And anticlines are a series of different layers. When we call them anticlines, it's because we know that the age of the anticline is the oldest in the center. If we don't know what the age is, then we call it a syncline. Okay. So, but this anticline in particular formed, you had all these layers banding inside of there, and then it just started eroding from the top down. So those bands go up, and they would have gone this way, just like an anticline does, but now that whole entire top has been shaved off through natural weather erosion, so it's left those bands exposed going up. But this layer was once flat at one time. Yes, yes, and this then, one, yep, yep. And then compression? Yep, exactly, uh, the, the Earth's crust moving around, fold, making those folds into the anticlines itself. Here's what's fascinating is, is that the Earth's crust, the crust that you're standing on right now, moves <laughs> and is moving right now all the time <laughs> when you feel earthquakes that's the earth's crust moving and there's even images that you can see of highways where the earth has shifted and moved and that's that plate layer moving and these plate layers have moved and what when you have these plates uh, uh, clacking into each other or attacking into each other you know that's how mountains are pushed up and formed and that's how these angle these layers can get chopped up at angles and this is one that got chopped up and then eroded down and we're looking at the edge of this erosion yeah absolutely so what turned us onto this layer was actually finding a lot of bone chunks on the surface all within kind of this one particular spot running up and down the hill here lengthwise um, we did find some more kind of complete bones coming up in the surface just going straight into the ground like some partial tibias um, we did find uh, some some vertebrae as well and that kind of inspired us you know hey we, we got to open this up you know there, there could be something in here you know, we don't know if these bones are scattered yet or if this is an associated animal. So that's what we're working on today. Okay. I'm really crossing my fingers for an associated animal. Yeah, so. no, because I mean, you know, we've got bone here, bone here, bone there, bone that, bone every. I told yeah, you, dude, yeah. it's everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. Uh, so what kind of animal do you think we have? What are we looking at? So here? in this portion of the two medicine, um, we're kind of more in the middle two medicine. Um, there's the upper, the, the lower, and the middle. Um, the middle two medicine is where we started to see the dawn of a dinosaur called Hypacrosaurus. Um, Hypacrosaurus is a Lambiosaur. Now, Lambiosaurs fit into the... I'm sorry, these are a lot of big words. I apologize. Um, Lambiosaurs are categorized in with the duckbill dinosaurs, okay. which are like a hadrosaur. But the Lambiosaurs were significantly larger. They got 35, 40 feet long, and they had big crests on their, on their head as well. 
And you know, you can see a lot of differences also in their taxonomy, like the shape of their femur, the shape of their vertebrae, the shape of their pelvic bones are significantly different from the standard hadrosaur. And so it's kind of fun that, you know, this is a very odd animal. You know, it's the lambiosaur, not hadrosaur. It is still a duckbill, but you know, it's, it's kind of more of a specialized one. So they're, they're, they're really neat and they got really big and it's really fun to find these big, huge bones and get them out of the ground. That's awesome, man. So, so what kind of bones do we have going well, on down here? Well, let's start over here. All right, let's hop, so. let's hop down here, guys. Okay, so what kind of bone do we have here? So what we have here is a tibia to one of those hypacrosaurs I was telling you about. Those okay. are the big, huge duckbill dinosaurs we get out here. Now, this is a huge bone, This is a man. nice long one. You can see that we knocked into it right here with the machine. So we took a lot of this out. But we have that in pieces above here, also in the foil too. Yeah. So it's really important they keep all this together because that will go back together. So we're actually not missing much of it. This is only about 15% of the bone that we're missing that got knocked out. So it's actually not too bad. Um, you know, you can tell this is a tibia because of this end over here. So that fans out really broad and that's yep. what the duckbill tibias do. And then as it comes down to the distal end going towards the ankle there, this, it, it, the, the lambiosaur tibias completely twist. So instead of going broad on this side too, it twists and, it get, and this broad side is actually going into the ground. Okay, so, so it's this lower bone right yes, here. Yes, yep, right? this is the lower tibia okay. bone. So now a hadrosaur tibia, instead of it twisting like that, it'd be broad on this end and broad on this end, all flush together. Oh. So but because this is lambiosaur, this is part of that taxonomy I was talking yeah. about, the bone completely twists and that broad side will be 90 degrees with this guy and it'll be facing this way instead. And so it's a pretty crazy taxonomy differentiation. That's and so, fascinating. Yeah. Well, what is it about the life of that animal that you think would have that weird bone twist? You know, I really couldn't tell you one way or another. It could be evolution. Um, it could just be a difference in the species itself. I really don't know. Personally, my guess would be just having to support the sheer weight of that animal. I mean, How heavy is this animal? You know, a 35-foot animal, or a dinosaur like, like the hypacrosaur, weighed somewhere between two to four tons. Wow! So that's a big animal. 35 feet? <laughs> yep, 35 feet that long is, is how huge. long they got. Yep, that's a big guy. Yeah. So, so this is a smaller one. I've seen hypacrosaur tibias that are upwards and over four feet long. Yeah. So this one's going to top out probably around three feet. So this is, you know, adult, but not quite full grown. <laughs> so. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, let's go look at our next bones down Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Come on over. Okay. So what do we got going on here? So here we got two different bones. Huh. Um, this is another tibia which actually matches the size of the one we have over here. So, so that's why you think we've got the same animal. This is why I'm starting to think we might have an associated animal. Okay. Now, if we found a third tibia, you know, then we know for sure, hey, not, a, not an associated animal. This is something different. Yeah. So, but since we have the two here, that could be one on each leg, essentially. This is a big rib over here. Now, that's really non-defining. You could find a rib of any dinosaur, basically. You know, they're really not rare, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> but this is just a good sign that, hey, we're on the right track. There could be more of this animal to come. We need to keep digging downward into this hill as well as north to south here. Okay. And so, well, let's talk about that because you're saying, you know, that's not really that rare. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, how rare are dinosaur fossils? You know, they're, the dinosaur fossils themselves are not rare at all. Rare dinosaurs are rare, if that makes that sense. That makes a lot <laughs> of know? sense. Yeah. So, there are more dinosaurs, like duckbills, for instance, are found significantly more than any other dinosaur. Triceratops, I'd say, is probably next in line. Um, that's one of the more common herbivores to be found and taken out of the ground. They're really not too terribly rare. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the big famous carnivores like T-Rex and things like that, those are a little bit more rare. You know, you don't really find a whole skeleton to those too terribly often. Well, so. generally in nature, there are far more herbivores than there are the carnivores. Exactly. That's just yep. the way it worked out back yep. then, and the same thing works out today. Yep, yep absolutely. Because, I mean, you know, when we were walking along this, I mean, there's dinosaur bone all over all yep, over the yep. place this entire anticline has exposures of dinosaur bone just leaching out slowly yeah now the trick is is finding where a lot of that bone is congregated um out here you know in these dried swamps sometimes you find what's called a lens if there was indeed water flow that did go through that swamp at some time maybe it's as little as a current over and over again from a Oh, when I can't remember the word all of a sudden, I'm sorry to say, when the ocean goes in and out. Um, <laughs> but, tide? Uh, from the tide, thank you. Um, not from, pods, Yeah, tide. <laughs> yeah not ocean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, from the tide itself, or else it could have been from water flow from a you know, different flash flood coming in. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of tough to say, really. So. Well, you know, I mean, here, here's the fascinating thing is, is that, you know, th that's one thing you, know, you think of is, is that, you know, these dinosaur fossils, they're so super rare, but it's not. There are rarer species, but there were just as many hadrosaurs running around now as there were buffalo back in the 1800s. <laughs> I mean, there were 
a lot of them, and a lot of them got over the millions of years of you know, and the chances and the and the math of fossilization that adds up to a lot of animals. Which is why where we're at, and generally when you find a layer that is fossil bearing, a formation, there's bone coming out of all over it yep. because you know there are a lot of fossils out there. Yep. You know, and science can only do. Science can only work with so many hadrosaurs. Yes, exactly. You know, I mean, yeah. th there have yeah. been tens of, uh, what, 5,000 hadrosaurs? I, you know, I, I really couldn't say offhand how many have been dug all over the world. I'd be willing to bet, though, it's upwards in the tens of thousands. Um, there's been quite a few. When you're talking completely globally, yeah. tons of them. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, you know, science can't do a lot with, you know, 10,000 of the same yeah. species. There's only so many duckbill pelvic bones they really need. Right, you know? for science. So. <laughs> but where this stuff could go do some really good is, is inspiring somebody like you, the next generation, to get out and to study this stuff and yep. to become the next paleontologist. Yep. So this is awesome, dude. Yeah, this is great. You, so what's the next step on this site? So, man, this is tough. You know, this is coming in at about that 45 degree angle, sometimes even a little bit more aggressively, like a 75 degree angle. So what we have to avoid is kind of the situation we have right now with this tibia going straight into the ground where you pothole yourself in. When you just dig a hole and kind of pothole yourself in there, all the pressure from the remaining rock still stands. Mm -hmm. So it gets really difficult as you get deeper in there. And that's when you can start making mistakes trying to get the bone out safely. So we're gonna have to get, the, get my little excavator, um, you know, do a lot of hand digging with shovels, get all of this rock out from around it and just completely expose those bones on all sides and get them nice and, you know, ready to excavate, I guess you could say. So of course you gotta glue down the cracks. You gotta take care of it as you go. You gotta do this very slowly, very methodically, very carefully. Otherwise, something that, you know, 74 million years in the making won't last 20 minutes with us. Right. So, right. And that's you know, a terrible feeling. And, you know, <laughs> speaking of something not lasting a long time, you know, once these bones get exposed, you know, which is what happened to the bones that are laying all over the surface, yeah, yeah. how long does this stuff last before it turns back into dirt? You know, this bone in particular is actually very dense, um, so it's not too bad in this layer. You know, if we just go 20 feet to the east here and get over into the next layer, completely different story there's a lot of iron in that layer so that mm -hmm. bone will turn to dust in just you know the next storm and really yes absolutely the iron eats right through this bone this one in particular though this layer the bone is really dense it's really hard it's really compact so it, it'll break into little pieces you know pretty quickly within the first year the first winter that freeze thaw effect will mm -hmm. make it crack and splinter apart but you can still collect those pieces and try to piece that back together when you see something coming out of the surface. So we have a little bit more of a window of this time. I'd say you probably have a few years, three, four, maybe five years at the most, before it just turns right back into dirt. But see, not a lot of time, no, which is why it's all. important for guys like Eamon and, and Northwest Mon and your team at Northwest Montana Fossils get out here and rescue these bones before erosion comes and destroys them. Yep. So yeah, I noticed you got your your we're armed. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yep, just real quick. Yeah. We're in Northwest Montana and you know, this is a large concentration of grizzly bears. Yep. So what, what is the reality that we're, why are you carrying a pistol? <laughs> well, you know, our dig season out here is only about three and a half, four months long or so between winter and coming into summer. And then it turns into winter again, unfortunately. Um, and in that time last year, we had 10 grizzly bears in our quarry. Um, so that's a pretty small window to see that many grizzly bears. Um, this area is what's known as the Grizzly Bear Superhighway. Um, you know, there's a lot of different water channels that go into the prairie and then comes back into the mountains here. They like to follow those water channels. And so, you know, those are canals, creeks, rivers, things like that. You know, there isn't a lot of grizzly bear left in the nation. Um, this is one of the few areas that there is this large of a concentration, a concentration in the lower 48 of the United States. Um, so it's really important that we respect them, you know, we, we don't want to intrude on them in any way, shape, or form, but it is unpredictable, so we do have to arm ourselves, we have to be safe. Safety first, um, no dinosaur bones are worth getting if your life is going to be in complete peril. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So, so we, like, we have to stay armed. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to go home for dinner tonight, so. <laughs> and not be dinner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So. No, I mean, it is super dangerous out here, you know. I mean, that's why, you know, uh, this year more so than others because yeah. this is coronavirus year and not as many people are out and roaming around and the bears are coming down into populated yeah. areas more and more. And actually, there was a gentleman not too far from where we're standing right now that was yeah. attacked by yeah, a grizzly bear this year. Yeah, just a few miles west of us, or east of us here. 
Um, he was attacked pretty early in the season. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So it, it we're 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 not tent camping this time. We're we are literally staying in our vehicles. Yep. Yeah. Because <laughs> we're out in the middle of nowhere. Oh, yeah. There's nothing. Yeah. We're we are an hour, an hour and a half drive from the nearest hospital or anything yeah. like that. So it's safety first. You must be very conscious. Always be bear aware. Keep all of your food in the vehicles. Please, for the love of God, don't keep trash just, you know, strewn around your campsite. That, don't that's, I, feed yeah. the bears. Yes, don't feed the bears. Yeah, so you just have to be safe and just be smart and have some common sense and very much so respect the sheer power of those animals. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, dude, we've got a major... St we've had storms rolling through all day today, so we've got major <laughs> storms coming in. So I guess the plan now is is to get down, dig onto yep, this until yep. it starts pouring yep, rain. Absolutely. And then we'll knock off and... Close up tomorrow. Absolutely, sounds great. All right, so, we're gonna cool. get this stuff dug out before it gets rained. All right. Dude, this has been an awesome day digging man you know we've got these other bones out and foiled up yep. and then we're down to some of our last stuff what do we got here so this is a metatarsal toe to one of the hypacrosaur dinosaurs okay and so you can tell ductile metatarsals from the hydrosaur versus the lambiosaur yeah or lambiosaur sorry um lambiosaur just on, yeah lambiosaur yeah. yeah just on the basic shape of what's called the proximal and the distal ends this is the proximal end this mm -hmm. would have been running up the foot and this is the distal end running down towards the toes. Okay. So the lambiosaurs, their proximal and distal ends are much more pronounced. They're a lot wider. They're a lot more flared out. With the hydrosaurs, they're a little bit more simply shaped. Okay. So. All yeah. right. What kind of tool, you know, I noticed we've been using some funny tools. Yeah. Yeah. Some tools, you know, you showed up with a bunch of screwdrivers. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. dude, what are we fixing? You know, it really varies. So, I mean, on... we got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, 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 you, you do pull out your tool chest with some pretty weird stuff when it comes to digging for dinosaurs. It really varies site to site what kind of tools you use. Um, but out here in particular, little picks, you know, hammers weighing between one and five pounds work really well and butter knives and things like that. Yeah, because so. I mean, we got a butter knife. Yeah, yeah. But you know what's wild though, is we've been using it, you know, the whole trip and I'm yeah. just like, man, this is a great tool. I know, <laughs> you so, wouldn't think so at all. But. That's right. So every, at your home right now, you have the tools to dig dinosaur bones. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no joke. So how Who's many um, how many uh, uh, other bones do we have over here total? You know, today? right now we're looking at six bones total that we found on this trip. Um, we need to dig significantly more. We have to go down into this really hard rock layer. Yeah. Because um, we're just hunting what's top of this layer yep. that's at yep. an angle going down this way. Yeah, yeah. So there could be a lot more underneath our feet right now. Unfortunately, a lot of this rock, it, it hasn't been exposed to oxygen or weathering processes in 74 million years. Yeah. You know? So it's been here a long time and we're the ones that are kind of breaking it apart for the first time yeah so what we might have to do i mean hopefully our machine can get in here and break this stuff apart and pull it back a little bit better without damaging the bone but if we can't then we have to wait till next year um, we have to let this freeze and thaw all winter let it soften up and we can come back and work you know hopefully next year another couple more feet down yeah. and take it one step at a time that way well, what's fascinating is is the process that destroys the bone can also help expose it as yep. well and help you get to it also you know i guess that's why they make glue yeah yeah no <laughs> joke no joke you know, i noticed there's a lot of rock yes. just in and around this thing so is that rock carried in as a part of this event? You know, the rock can be uh, a couple of things. Um, sometimes it can be what's called fluval activity. Okay. And a fluval rock means that there's heavy water flow that came in. And that's why you see some of the rocks kind of log jammed against the bones. You know, that's, that's where the rocks set in place. The water flow pushed them into that spot and that's where they've sat ever since. Um, other times with rocks being in the mate or being within this, with the, the ground here or the layer here, I guess you could say, um, it, it's what's called caliche stone. And caliche stone, it comes from very fast, rapid evaporation from swamps and shallow ponds and things like that. Sometimes river banks too, that kind of, they oxbowed and it got really deep and then the river dried up and that stayed as a pond for a while. Um, so there's a couple different processes and how these rocks can get in here. Mm -hmm. But whenever you see something called high energy, you know, a, a layer that has lots of little pebbles in it, 
that's when I start to get pretty excited because um, that means that there's some sort of water movement going on and there's probably a little critter trapped in there somehow. Now, is that just here in the two medicine or is that in other formations oh, that's as well? In other formations all straight across the board. So whenever you see a layer that's got a lot of pebbles and stuff, mm -hmm. that means you've got a big flow coming in yep. and all that. Yep, exactly. That's exactly. interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting and, and it kind of helps you uh, learn how to read the land, I guess yeah. you could say. So that way you're not just, you know, hunting blindly. Well, and you know, that's what you've got to do out here and that's what these guys do is is they walk they hunt the land i mean this formation is what 400 miles that yeah, way, yeah yeah and 500 miles yeah, that it's way a big formation and and there's bone all along it but you have to look for the concentrations and that goes into reading that layer when you see you're walking along this layer and you start to see these pebbles popping out that's a good sign that there's something going on there and you need to stop and pay attention to that yep absolutely you know? and that's just something that comes with time and comes with experience yeah yeah and, and once you start to see it you know when you get it down the first time you'll start to see it everywhere yeah. and you'll start to see how much how many times you walked past something like that not knowing that that's where you should dig yeah and so well we yeah. appreciate you sharing your experience with oh, us your knowledge anytime. your time and letting us come play with anytime we, we bones, love dude. having you guys out here you're more than welcome at any time well, anytime thank you so. for letting us play in your sandbox dude i like this sandbox <laughs> anytime this, this is a very good, fun so. one Thank you, Chase. Thank appreciate you very much, you. man. Absolutely, man. And we appreciate you guys out there watching. If you guys want to uh, learn out more about us or, or want to get a hold hold of you, well, where's, where can people get a hold of you? You at? know, the best place to get a hold of us is on our Facebook page. It's called Northwest Montana Fossils. Um, we're on there almost every day, unless we're digging, <laughs> and we're happy to answer any questions that you have. And so, and God knows, we love talking about fossils. So. Yeah. <laughs> so hit Eamon up. If you want to get a hold of us, you can contact us through the Smoky Mountain uh, Relic Room. You can go to our website at www.therelicroom.com or our Facebook or Instagram page at uh, Smoky Mountain Relic Room. You can find us there. And this is Chasing History, which is the educational arm of the Smoky Mountain Relic Room, the Fossils that you see for sale inside of the relic room come from guys like this, from places like this. So we appreciate <laughs> you guys watching. And remember, guys, history rocks! Woohoo! Why did the dinosaur cross the road? To get away from Twitter, because Twitter is evil, that's why. <laughs> Twitter sucks. Do you have Twitter? Nope. Uh, see? Twitter's awful. Oh, why can't you hear a pterodactyl going to the bathroom? I don't know why. Because the pee is silent. <laughs> I've heard that. Is the past tense of Twitter that you twattered? <laughs> that's all I got. <laughs>